Creating. Um, this is the title actually of my whole dissertation and my advisor is Dr. Lasco. But please take note that I will only be presenting to you one out of five um, objectives of my study. This is the first objective that I will present to you. The remaining four objectives are in support to the results of my first objectives. But anyway, I hope that I can satisfy your expectations today. So, uh, uh, first, I will discuss to you what about peatlands and climate change and peatlands in the Philippines, objectives, conceptual framework, materials and methods, results and discussion, conclusion, and then the challenges ahead. So, it may be very strange for you to hear the word peatland. What are peatlands in the first place? So, let me bring back, let me bring you back in the year 1997. As shown here, this is a satellite uh, image from NASA. This happened in Indonesia. The, um, the, the greenish color that you see there is the haze that was produced when certain um, forests burned in Indonesia. Let me tell you today that that kind of forest were peat forests. So what about it? Um, during that time, 1997, there was an emission of 400 million tons of carbon dioxide out from this, out from this um, incidence alone. And um, it is estimated to cost uh, 9 billion US dollars. So peatlands are therefore significant carbon sink, but are very vulnerable that it is so easy for this significant carbon sink to be converted into a carbon source. So where are peatlands found and what basically is peatland? So here we have a definition from a peatland scientist, Dr. Susan Page, and she defined it as wetland ecosystems in which the production of organic matter exceeds its decomposition, therefore net accumulation results. So what environmental conditions are favorable for net accumulation of organic matter? Ladies and gentlemen, it is the water logging condition in all peatlands that retard decomposition, natural decomposition processes. So here we see the distribution of peatlands. But please don't get the image wrong because the degree of greenness that you see there is, uh, means the percentage of, uh, I mean the hectareage of peatland areas in a particular country, for example. So the darker the, 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 green, the, darker the green shade is, these are areas with, um, with more peatlands. So as you can see, it occupies in the northern hemisphere, the, the temperate region of the, of the northern hemisphere. And some portions there is very visible in, uh, in, in, in somewhere in the equator. So why should we Filipinos, why should we Southeast Asian people care about peatlands? when in fact the bulk of the peatlands are in the temperate ones, in the temperate regions. So you will discover that today. For your information, peatlands, specifically tropical peatlands, store more carbon, you know, store sig more significant CO2 in their peat as compared to temperate peatlands by virtue of their age and by virtue of the thickness of peat deposit. So let me give you some values. Although it only occupies 3% of the world's area, it contains at least 550 gigatons, that is 550 billion tons of carbon in their peat, which is equivalent to 30% of the global soil carbon, 75% of all atmospheric carbon, equal to all terrestrial biomass, and twice the carbon stock in the forest biomass of the world. Second point, it contains more carbon per hectare than other ecosystems on mineral soil. In the subpolar zone, is tropical peatlands are said to be 3.5 times higher. In boreal zone, 7 times. In the tropical zone, 10 times as much. Here you see the secret of tropical peatlands unfolding, that they are, um, they are more significant carbon store than the temperate peatlands. Thirdly, according to Holden, the long-term ability of peatlands to absorb carbon dioxide from the atmosphere means that they play a major role in moderating atmospheric CO2 concentrations, which has a direct impact in moderating global climate. So I've already said the reasons why um, 
Southeast Asian peatlands are very significant carbon sources. So basically, here is a description, uh, I mean, an illustration why tropical peatlands, actually they are kind of, peatlands are, have many types. There are forested peatlands and there are peatlands that are non-forested. But our concern here is a forested, tropical peatland. So here you see in the left side, uh, it is a figure showing a dry land forest. So most of the carbon is stored in the above ground biomass, no? in the trees. However, if you say forested peat, most or the most significant carbon storage is below ground, not really above ground. So this is a tale of two reverse scenarios. Here you see how a particular peatland becomes a carbon sink and how, and how it becomes a carbon source. So how are the peatlands now? This is the general picture of peatlands all over the world. Peatlands, since there is little knowledge about peatlands, nobody really cares about peatlands. They are considered wastelands. In land use planning, they are considered um, marginal lands. Even in soil survey reports in the Philippines, they are called undif undifferentiated groups of soils, meaning it is the least concern of the government what kind of soils these are. So here you see fire, drainage, and another fire there. These pictures are in, were, were taken from Indonesian uh, peat fires. So the status is not single, not it's complicated, but rather cleared, drained for food and cash crops, such as oil palms and other plantations, exploited for timber, drained for plantation forestry, extracted for industrial and domestic fuel, and in Europe, is, it is horticulture and gardening that uh, serves as a threat. So are there peatlands in the Philippines? There was a peatland scientist that I was fortunately, that I was able to, for, I was fortunately able to meet, which is uh, Dr. Jonathan Davis, last November 2010. And when he visited in 2006, he was able to have this rapid assessment in determining where, er, what areas in the Philippines have probable peatlands. Now, what is the significance? Because if you, if, if you try to analyze the geology and the topographical settings of the Philippines, a soil scientist can normally predict that there are lots of peatland areas in the Philippines but are not identified. So these are the areas. The green ones are really 100% peat areas. The red triangles that you see are still suspected peat areas. So here you see two uh, tri green triangles, namely, namely in Leyte Saba and one in Agusa Marsh. However, Leyte Saba peatland is considered a degraded peatland. This picture that you are seeing right now is a picture of one peatland site in Agusan Marsh where I live three hours away. This is Bunawan Peat Area. Because in Agusan Marsh, there are two declared uh, peat areas and some are just suspected, still subject for soil surveys. Now you see that this picture was taken in 1991 and it already showed um, threats of land conversion, logging, and fire. When I last visited in 2010, here in Bunawan Peat Area, you can really see peat subsidence, meaning there is no longer peatland. Because once the waterlogged peatland is oxidated, the peatland virtually disappears. Only the mineral substratum is left. So you can only just imagine how much tons of carbon dioxide was emitted back to the atmosphere by virtue of not recognizing the fragility of the peatland ecosystems. So the objective of my study, this is my first objective, we should uh, try to determine the above ground carbon storage of peatland as well as its below ground carbon storage in these certain carbon pools. And secondly, we have to identify the present role of Kaimugan peatland in the context of climate change. So this is the conceptual framework of the study. Here you can see that the peatland forest, it has the forest zone, the root zone, and the peat zone. Here you see a greater thickness 
represented by, by the brown circle. And there are two pathways to carbon emission, natural and anthropogenic. But I would like you to focus on the anthropogenic, which I made the larger, uh, the, the arrow larger in the anthropogenic, because that is the hypothesis that Kainugan peatland is now at the verge of threats from surrounding communities. So you, we also here see the importance of how the community understands the, system, the ecosystem where they live, because practically they are the, the resource users as well as the decision makers. How will they utilize the natural resources surrounding them? So this is the heart of my thesis. So first, I have to describe to you my study site. Uh, the one you see bounded by a black broken line is the whole of Kainpugan peatland, which according to perimeter survey of DNR, is 5,325 hectares, and it covers the municipalities of San Francisco on the right side and Talakogon on the left side. It is said to be located within the Agusan Marsh, but only a portion is within the boundaries of the Agusan Marsh Wildlife Sanctuary. I have to mention Agusan Marsh in the title of my dissertation because it has an implication to the actual management of the Kainpugan peatland because the red lines that you see, Agusan Marsh is a very big wetland, but not all parts of the wetland is considered a protected area by NIPAS. So the red lines that you see is the boundary of Agusan Marsh Wildlife um, Sanctuary, the protected area. Now you see that not all portions of Kainpugan peatland is located, is within the boundary of the protected area. So that has implications to the management. Although this portion of the study will be addressed by my other objectives. At least uh, I'm telling you this issue. So what about Kainpugan peatland? There, I told you before that there are lots of peatland types in the Philippines. And my Kainpugan peatland is an ombotrophic peat dome, meaning it is a dome. It tends to it tends to be thicker as you go inward. And what is so peculiar about this ecosystem is that it is like, um, it is the, the boundary, the dark green hue that you see there represent the tall pole forest. It has three types of vegetation zone. First, outward from the Kainpugan peatland is a tall pole forest, followed by an intermediate forest. And you see there the, the yellow shade represents the pygmy forest, where peat deposits, peat depths are greatest. Later, you will, you will understand more. And the situation in Kainpugan peatland, since theoretically it only receives specific water through rainfall, the substrate, the peat, and the water within the peat is very acidic. And my results showed that acidity range from 2.45 to 4.99, very acidic. So here, since it is my objective to represent, to, to enable to, to arrive at a value representing each vegetation zone, because logic would tell you that a different vegetation zone would practically have a different value for carbon estimates by virtue of analy an analysis of its above ground and below ground carbon pools. <coughs> so according to Jonathan Davis, Three vegetation um, types or facing communities are observed in the peatland. That is the tall pole forest, usually 35 meters, 35 feet uh, tall trees, intermediate forest around 15 feet tall trees, and in pygmy forest around five, uh, five feet tall trees. So here is the absence presence data. Of, of the trees that we were able to, found, to find in, uh, inside the peatland. And usually, these uh, species, according to my dad, whom I hired as a forester for this research, these, some of these species are beach species. And they have developed for themselves pneumatophores, the characteristic that we usually encounter with mangroves. This is implicative of the anaerobic condition in the peatland. They have to raise their roots since there is limited supply of oxygen. So here you see that although from a, from a, 
from a logical standpoint, biodiversity is not so rich, but the kind of species inhabiting the area are highly specialized and tolerable to harsh conditioned species. So that is something very remarkable about the area when you examine the vegetation. So how did I measure the carbon storage in all the pools? So based on the source book given to me by, by, by my advisor, um, I utilized a rectangular nested plot. Since the area, even though it is uh, belonging in one particular facing community, the, the diameter at breast height of trees are varied. So this, this kind of sampling plot is most recommended for such kind of, ecos of uh, forest type. So here you see um, my, uh, my sampling plot. So where did I position my sampling plots? Here you see the stars. Um, there are three vegetation types. And there is a hypothesis that there is a symmetry in the peatland. So first, you encounter a tall pole forest, followed by an intermediate forest, and then pygmy forest, and then another pygmy, and then another intermediate, and another tall pole. So to avoid, uh, to, to increase reliability, um, me and my advisor thought of having to establish sampling plots um, in each vegetation type at different locations. Three nested sampling plots within one vegetation type in one location. So it totals to 18 nested plots. By the way, accessibility within the peatland was very unfriendly. I went there during a summer summer month of May, and it is said to be the driest month in the peatland. However, I encountered pools within the peatland, so it was like a kumonoi. It's like a quick mud, if there is such word. So, when I consulted with my statistician, Professor Kosikov, in stat, she she told me that uh, we can never discount. Uh, we can always consider. The, the difficulty of penetrating the area. So because I was uh, considering the validity of my analysis later on. So in cases like that, there is still an appropriate method of analysis as long as the, the author will just cite the limitations. So for standing trees, this is a general biomass equation formula from Brown, which is applicable to forest types like Kaimpugan peatland, which has annual precipitation of greater than 4,000 millimeters. In peatland, in the, in the peatland, it's 4,685 millimeters annual rainfall. For understory and herbaceous vegetation as well as litter, it's the fresh weight until uh, dry weight, and then just multiply it with, with the equation. And uh, for peat soils, this is more technical, um, we use the flash elemental analyzer in uh, analytical soils lab in Erie, analytical service lab in Erie, to, to enable, uh, for us to get the total organic carbon of the peat profiles. But the peat profiles were subject, there are different level, or there are different layers in a peat profile. So all horizons observed in the field were given representative samples with three replicates each. So for the analysis part, a two-factor factorial incomplete randomized design was used. Since we would like to look into the, the, the influence of number one, vegetation, number two, location, and thirdly, the interaction of vegetation and location. Test procedure used was a two-way ANOVA with selected vegetations and locations as factors and Duncan's multiple range test. The null hypothesis include there is no significant difference in carbon storage in standing trees between the three vegetation zones and in the two sampled locations. There is no significant difference in carbon storage in, in for understory vegetation between the three vegetation zones and the two sample locations, and so on. The fourth null hypothesis is that carbon stocks in the peat soil of Kaimpugan peatland does not significantly differ from the below-ground carbon stocks. 
So here are the results for the above ground carbon stocks. Um, upper left, you see there the, the tons of carbon per hectare among standing trees. Here you see uh, very high values in the tall pole forest, which is very obvious if you try to look at the, the biomass of the trees. For understory herbaceous vegetation, um, vegetation zone is not a factor according to the analysis, but rather the location. So here I showed you that there are uh, tons, of car tons of carbon per hectare in the first area sample is higher than the second. I will tell you later what are the implications of these values. And here you see in the upper right corner, weighing 50 tons, is the carbon, tons of carbon per hectare in the litter. These are the fallen leaves. Here, according to the analysis, vegetation and location, the interaction of both is a factor. That's why I am showing you here the three vegetations sampled at two locations. Now you see the values there. Uh, TPF has the highest in litter, specifically in location number one. So if you are to see, if you are to compare the different above ground carbon pools across the three vegetation zones, you will see in the lower right uh, figure that um, the tall pole forest has the highest uh, biomass for standing trees and the entire carbon storage of all the above ground, followed by the intermediate forest and then the pygmy forest, which actually follows the logic. For the below ground carbon stocks, here you see a humongous orange color, while you only see nil, <laughs> green and red colors. So this is implicative of higher carbon storage in the highly decomposed horizons of the peak profile. Um, H, I, H, E, and H, O connotes the different levels of the decomposition according to von post scale of humi humification as I have examined the soil samples in the field. So since the H, A horizons, the highly advanced, uh, the, the advanced, the highly advanced, decom highly decomposed advanced, somewhere there, is uh, the deepest, uh, is the deepest uh, layer in the, in the peat profile. That's why it explains the, the extremely high value of carbon content. So now, if you are to, to stand side by side, trees, herbaceous, litter, and peat soil, you see there that the peat soils are remarkably higher than the carbon storage in the above ground pools. And as you can see here in the values, that in fact, in the tall pole forest, the total of below ground carbon ranges is 25 to 34 times higher than the total above ground carbon. And what is most uh, surprising, uh, not surprising, but because it follows the logic, what made me so happy, my hypothesis was validated, that the, 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 the total below ground carbon in the pygmy forest is 374 to 733 times higher than its total above ground carbon. These results support the results of Dr. <laughs> Dr. Page and Dr. Davis as they analyzed Bornean and Indonesian peatlands. So here I would like to uh, show you a video Here you will see the depths of peat in the pygmy forest. Here you see that the water 
table is, is encountered almost near the peat surface. That's why the composition is retarded. These are my forest guides, as well as my hired labor. So I have to stop from there. So, so sad to say that the, the improvised measuring device for us to measure the, the peak depth was only as tall as 5 meters. But actually, as we have inserted it, it's even deeper. And one a reporter from ABS-CBN measured it as 16, greater than 16 feet because every time we jump, it's like we are standing in a spongy substrate. You bounce when you jump. But you will find out that the water, of, that the, the water is already here in your, in your knee or sometimes in the waist. So that's how tricky the forest floor is. This is quite expected in ombotrophic kinds of peatlands because they are really characterized by its domey shape, implicative of its very deep peat profiles as you go inside the peatland. I hope you enjoy the mini movie. The guy who inserted the pole was, by the way, my father. So here are the results for the total carbon storage. There are different values representing the three vegetation zones. Here you see remarkably high is the pygmy forest by virtue of the depth of its peat soil. And uh, if we are to, to estimate for the whole Kaimpugan peatland, it amounts to 22, there is a conservative and a less conservative estimate. It amounts to 22.86 to 22.99 million tons of carbon stored in the peatland. But I would like to say to you that this is a very conservative estimate because we have not measured the carbon stored in the roots. It's very impossible because we have to kill the trees and it violates my being an environmentalist if I will do that. But anyway, I am satisfied with, uh, with its uh, million tons of carbon, which is similar to other Southeast Asian peatlands. So my results as a response to my hypothesis a while ago there is a significant difference in carbon stocks in standing trees between the three vegetation zones, meaning vegetation is a factor. Two, there is a significant difference in carbon stocks in understory herbaceous vegetation between the two locations sampled. This is because the second location sample, which garnered a lower carbon storage in terms of its understory and herbaceous vegetation, it is because the area where I, wait, where I took sample samples is already a degraded area. I was really sad that within the heart of Kaimpugan peatland, there is already poaching and burning of forest patches. And number three, there is a significant difference in carbon stock in litter as a factor of the interaction between vegetation and location. And lastly, the below ground carbon stocks in the peat soil is largely higher than all the above ground carbon stocks, even the combination of all. Therefore, Kaimpugan peatland is a carbon sink at present conditions. So with this amount of tons of uh, carbon stored in the peatland, it means to say that it is a space-efficient carbon store. It doesn't have to be very big to have a large amount of stored carbon as compared to other forest ecosystems in the Philippines. Secondly, the most significant carbon pool in the system is the peat soil since its carbon storage estimates are exceptionally higher than any of the above ground pools combined. The role of Kaimpugan peatland is a net carbon sink, therefore mitigating the emission, prevention the emi preventing the emission of carbon dioxide. Indeed, human activities around Kaimpugan peat dome matter to keeping the ecological integrity of the peatland as it presently serves as a significant carbon sink mitigating climate change as an ecosystem. But I would like to, to tell you the challenges. Yes, it is a significant carbon sink as of its time, but it may not go on forever like this. Specifically that we have encountered lots of uh, evidences of uh, peatland disturbances, such as conversion to rice agriculture, the same case with Bunawan peatland, which is now a degraded peatland, 
they convert the the periphery of the Kainpugan peatland into rice agriculture, which, by the way, never flourished due to their lack of understanding of the dynamics of peat soils, th therefore affecting rural poverty and agriculture and so on, domino effect. And we also here see the burning of forest patches along the periphery as well as within the peatland, which is um, evidenced by the growth of these ferns. According to my botanist friends, they call it um, Teridium aquilinum species, which are known to be pioneer species after a great disturbance. So when I examine this vast fern country within the peatland, I have discovered, oh, I have realized that what I am stepping onto are down charcoal wood. So this is a really strong evidence that there are already past peat fires, no, anthropogenic by nature. Uh, anthropogenic peat fires and the the coming of many people the staying of people along the periphery they do hunting they do poaching and all these undesirable things to the peatland ecosystem so it may be a carbon sink but soon we don't know that is still a challenge to all of us so this is the the picture of the vast me forest I allowed my hired labor to climb the very thin and small tree just for me to have this picture of how how vast how beautiful is the pygmy forest and according to dr. Jonathan Davis it doesn't mean that when it's stunted it's not mature because we have to prove it that the peatland is a mature forest because all these small stunted trees are already functioning like a mature tree by virtue of its fruits and uh, and flowers so this is the pygmy forest and i thank you for your attention Since you've established that the challenge is for us to protect this uh, fragile ecosystem, I'm just wondering if at least the government agency in, in that area or at least the community people are aware of how important that ecosystem is or, it, or if they have like some management strategies to keep that safe. Yes. Um, yes, but it's at still it is still in its infancy stage because actually the local people do not even call it as a peatland. If you don't call it a peatland, you entirely miss the point because you don't identify it as a peat soil. They just call it Katingalahan in Visaya, which I would like to translate as a wonderland. They just wonder why the forest looks like that. And um, although these people are are actually indigenous of uh, lumads. They have this uh, spiritual belief about penetrating the area, you will be punished, you will be killed. But due to the influence of migrants who, sh who, who, um, who, is, who are more wealthy than the lumads because they extract forest resources in the peatland, they were envious of the prosperity of the migrants therefore abandoning their their spirit uh, their belief in the in the spirit world and um, the government now by because of dr davis he's he's always he's, he he is uh, keep on coming back he keeps on coming back and so um, he was able to steer uh, the attention of the the man environmental managers the penro the menro but again uh, they are still on paper not really on the active action stage Let's have a uh, surf first and then we next. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you for your uh, uh, presentation. Uh, I'm a forester and I was in Akutan Sur for four years with the Gwen Industrial Development Corporation in Latin And I was in uh, uh, 
the other province, Agusan Norte, Misamis Oriental and Mugino, when I was with the, for seven years when I was with the specific number company and affiliated companies. Uh, well, we were, since our, uh, I would like to ask you if the areas uh, you have studied are under license by a, a NGO or uh, is it the public forest? Okay, sir, um, that, that is a very good question. Actually, it is the portion uh, of the peatland which is covered by the Naipas law, which is within the boundary of Agusan Marsh Wildlife Sanctuary. It's so ironic because although it's a protected area, when you look into the land classification map, there are still alienable and disposable lands within the peatland. And there are ancestral domain claims also that are not yet identified which specifically. So there are there are um, there is a chaos uh, pertaining to who really owns the land, although it is already protect declared as a protected area. Uh, well, in, in these areas, uh, the license areas or areas uh, given to the timber licenses are under protection by the licenses. But some areas that are not under license, which are public lands, uh, accordingly, they, they belong to the natives. Yes, yes. And uh, the natives do not accept forest laws. Uh, they cut at their own pleasure when we interfere. I am number 664 in the uh, Philippine Forest reports. When we, I joined the, this NSO, this uh, organization based in Bayugan, Apusanso, to protect the forest, uh, also in San Francisco, in Tarapoto. We were almost killed. So we gave up and uh, they now uh, convinced the local governments to, to take care of this, to take care of the protection of these areas. In fact, uh, one of my foresters in the Wind Industrial Development Corporation became a secretary to the mayor of Tarapongo, uh, Forester uh, uh, Pete uh, Muniz. I, I think he's still there and he's still alive. But uh, every day, this is the problem. Every day, the logs are coming down the, the creeks, the rivers, because the, these people, these natives, do not have the, uh, the, the transportation uh, usually used in logging by the timber licenses and the timber licenses refuse to uh, to lend or lease this uh, transportation or vehicles to the natives. So what do natives do is they float. Yes, they use the river and the tributaries the to transport the logs. Yeah. What we do here at Tibor, when since uh, we need logs for export. We bought them. We we, we bought the logs uh, uh, the, uh, at the bridge in uh, Bayugan because here the river is narrow and the logs do not go down to the one city in the Bosanur Bay. So we we load these the trucks and brought them to the log park in uh, the town now, uh, where. These logs are uh, picked up yes, by sir. I agree now, with you until now that problem still exists. Specifically that the only aware uh, jurisdiction is the Kaimpugan San Francisco part. I have told you a while ago that Talakobon is also part, no? Consistent within the boundary of the Kaimpugan peatland. Talakobon is not doing any um, intervention to, to control the number of people going into the peatland. So it might be that San Francisco Kaimpugan Park is exhausting all their efforts, but without cooperation of the Talakogon side, it, it's, it's still for me in vain. Now, your uh, study uh, revealed that uh, the, 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 where the areas uh, are uh, populated by tall trees, yes. the carbon uh, content is greater, greater than the other uh, types of forests, is it? Only in the above ground biomass, the tall pole forest, because as, as, as a vegetation zone, if you total above and below ground, 
what is as, uh, as, uh, outstanding is the pygmy forest so because of its peak. Well, in forestry, there is this uh, in selective logging regulations. Uh, we have this, uh, we have this uh, logging. We have this timber stand improvement. We have this enrichment planting. So uh, probably you could suggest to the DNR and to the to the timber licenses when you go back there that Forester Mauricio join you in uh, convincing these people to follow the selective logging regulations. Because uh, when I was there, again, I was almost killed several times because I know selective logging. They do not want selective logging. They want their own logging system. And, uh, well... <laughs> okay, sir, I will be so. So, thank you very much for your uh, thank you. uh, presentation. Uh, first, we have uh, this and then uh, Mr. Dow and then you. So, yes, ma'am. First, Good afternoon. My name is Aisa. I'm from Sesam. Thank you very much for the very interesting presentation. I just have two questions. Earlier, you mentioned that the peat land covers an estimated 5,500 hectares. Mm -hmm. I would like to ask if that is uh, for the present measurement or if not, when was that taken? So that we will at least be able to compare the area at the present and perhaps in the past. I mean uh, in terms of vegetation cover. I would like to ask as well if you have uh, data on the rate of uh, peatland area loss in the Philippines to be able to determine if um, to be able to determine how much time we have left in order to save the peatland and to institute the legal measurements to protect it because at the moment we find that it's lacking. Uh, that's for the first. The second question would be, as Sir Mauricio earlier pointed out, the, the area now belongs to the, the community, the indigenous people, and they have at their disposal the sovereignty to cut it down or what. Uh, what ecosystem services or opportunities for community benefits did you see that people will be able to generate if this area is protected? So that when it's protected, they can say it will be down to our benefits. Because without that, even if we institute legal protections, if these people are not convinced it's going to benefit them, then it's not going to be effective because they will not cooperate. So what are these opportunities by which they can see that they will be benefited so that at least we can find hope for its protection? Thank you. Okay. So the 5,325 hectare as a, val as, as a value for hectare for hectareage in uh, Kaimpugan is, is in 2006 when DNR had a perimeter survey. So uh, when I talked with a GIS expert, Professor Abukai, the best thing that we can do is to do a time series analysis and because you, in the satellite image, even just Aster satellite image, you can really see the three vegetation zones by virtue of reflectance. So we can then um, estimate the actual the hectareage before of the peatland and now. But sad to say that we have come up with a new land classification map in uh, land cover map in Kaimpugan peatland, the one I've shown you with stars. This is um, based in year 2002 because when we went into the Globus USGS um, open source satellite image, 2002 is the only year where you can see clearly Kaimpugan peatland because of the cloud covers. Because as, as what I have said, that 4,685 millimeters per year rainfall. So the cloud covers are really big uh, considerations just as how we arrived uh, in, the, uh, in the 2002 hectareage of Kaimpugan peatland, which is actually early, uh, slightly higher than the 2006 value. Because in our in the in the land cover map that we generated based on the 2002 satellite image, the, the area of the peatland by virtue of um, uh, ocular inspection of the reflectance, it amounts to 5,400 plus hectares. So, really, that is good uh, question. And until now, we don't have that value for the, how much peatland are lost. 
because actually peatland is a new word in the in the country so right now the challenge is identifying the areas that are suggestive of the existence of peatlands and another question is about the ecosystem services provided that would be more relevant yes uh, this was discussed by my the rest of my four objectives that of all the ecosystem services provided by the peatland they only know of the flood regulation function because Agusan Marsh is a flood plain of the Agusan River Valley, so Agusan River Basin. So during floods, it absorbs because the peat has a very high water absorption capacity. So during floods, it absorbs too much water and then during the dry season, it slowly releases to become source of water, especially for the agricultural uh, sector. That's the only thing that they know of because that's what they actually witnessed through time. And uh, tourism is quite active now in the area, especially for extreme outdoor adventure people, because it's not Kaimbogan peatland is not for the faint-hearted and the and the unhealthy people because of the unfriendly situation in the forest. So we know then, according to my analysis in in other objectives of my study, that these are the things that will be more relevant for the people. Carbon storage function is intangible. They cannot, they really don't see the relevance because they cannot see it. So, um, with regards to measures taken by Penro, there are so many officials during the PAMBI meeting, but they really have not formalized any step. There is the National Action Plan for Protection of Peatlands are still in the draft uh, stage. They're still drafting it. It has not been finalized yet. So that's the, the, these are the improvements for now. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the very inspirational uh, presentation because it's opened my, opened my eyes to be uh, prepared more better research for my PhD. <laughs> It's really inspirational because it really give me, uh, can be give something to the other people and help the other the, the. Okay, uh, and it's really really true that Indonesia is the biggest problem for the burning of the forest. And I have experienced two times uh, inside the burn of the forest during I observe my lovely deer or usang. Uh, According to that one, I want to ask, because I, I don't have experience about the peatland, but in forest, uh, about the USA and the other, I do it. Uh, what, what kind of the species of the wetland there inside the peatland? The second about the question about the... Uh, in Indonesia now, they have a program from Norway here, Norway government, that gives the funding to Indonesian agent, uh, Indonesian government, if they can planting minimum 1 million trees. So, is it uh, Philippines get it, the program, or not? The third about the discussion about, because if it is yes, it's really helpful, because the government is really can be moved. Indonesian government before cannot move anything. But when some uh, one country offered them with the funding, now they are really moved. Uh, the last about the methodology because I see the factoria that you use and uh, you say that you have uh, two, uh, two factors that you use it's the vegetation and location. That's the interaction. Pardon? And the interaction of vegetation. Ah, yes, I mean that the two factors is vegetation and location. Uh, I just thinking that is it factoria or split plot? Can you explain to us? Thank you. Okay, so the first question, the wildlife. Well, there has not been any faunal assessment within the peatland um, because the, the friends of the late Leonardo Po is supposed to, to do that, but upon his death, they, they started to be very careful upon choosing research sites. So according to my survey, interviews and also surveys that I did that was elaborated in my other objectives, um, the most striking there is the presence of the Philippine deer. And uh, they burn, the people burn 
the, 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 the trees in the pygmy forest because deers, according to my forest guides, are very attracted to charcoal. They eat it. So when people burn the trees, there's charcoal, they are calling the attention of deers, and that's what they prepare for festivals, for birthdays, and all the occasions. They have deer meat. And they also have uh, um, the presence of uh, owls. Actually, that owl was given to me by my forest guide, but I set it free. It, it, you know, it, it doesn't coincide with my profession. And um, while chicken, they were not very. They were not able to to pinpoint the scientific names of, of this of this uh, wildlife. But what is most striking is the presence of the Philippine deer. The second question is more on. Ah uh, yes, um, Australia has been helping. Uh, has been donating money actually for community livelihood projects. Because unless you provide an alternative livelihood, they will continue to extract resources in the peatland. However, even the NGO assigned to manage the money from Australia, which is Propigenous Foundation Incorporated, and I was very fortunate because the, the team leader for Kaimpugan study is just my neighbor. I never knew she was my neighbor. I was calling her, but she's just my neighbor. She told me that Kaimpugan is one of the most difficult communities to to you know to to organize they 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 planted already trees across hibong river immediately within the periphery of the peatland but when they saw the trees growing they were the ones who also harvested it because rice agriculture is not doing good in the periphery so when they found out that rice agriculture is not good they resorted to cutting the trees uh, therefore uh, the NGO is very careful now in terms of dispersing money and um, that's the sad uh, truth because it's a very complicated community. Lumads, different Lumads, Higaonon and Manobo, different sets of beliefs and they are, they, are, they are fighting which is dominant, which is more, which, who is the superior, who, who, who established the community first, that is a very big issue. Plus they saw the prosperity of the migrants who extract resources. So this is also a key, fact, a key component to be analyzed, which is addressed by my other objectives. And uh, about the split plot, yes, I thought that I would also be using split plot, but since my ability to, to identify the proper analytical method is limited. I really went to Instat for them to, to analyze. They, we had an interview schedule, half-day interview, and when I described to them the, the nature of my sampling and the nature of my thesis area, they have all unanimously decided that it should be two-factor factorial CRD. So with that, I rest my case. <laughs> Uh, other question? Yes, sir. No, the... the, the oh, yes. <laughs> All right. Um, and, uh, that's thank you, Van, for a very interesting study and presentation. Um, um, it's nice to know that we were able to come up with a figure determining the, the carbon sequestration potential of, of the peatland. And in your conclusion, you, you mentioned also that the, the peatland is a carbon sink. Um, in, but there could be two, right? There, um, a peatland would be carbon emitter as well as carbon sequester. So I am interested now, uh, maybe you were not, uh, I'm not sure if you were able to mention about how you determine the figure for the, the carbon emission, emission maybe carbon emission, such that maybe uh, you can deduct that one. So mm -hmm. it's safer to conclude that um, carbon, I know peatland is really a carbon sink. Yes, thank you. I have consulted that point with my advisor and um, since the frequency of my visit in the study area is limited, that kind, of, uh, that kind of information that I wish to gather as well requires more time after these values because I can use other values from Indonesian peatlands but the kind of peatland that is in Kaimpugan is yes, similar in type, 
but they are of different maturity. So it has to be another value for the emission factor. So um, I, I decided so that I could finish my study, I would just put it in my limitation. And then for future studies, because I need to survey the rest of the portions of Kaimpugan peatland for me to come up with a good estimate for that value. Because as you can see, my route is just here in the lower portion. Because my forest guides would not allow me to penetrate in the upper portion. Because they have told me that they have already been lost for six days within the peatland. Because even the compass, you cannot read the compass within the peatland. So it's really a, it's still a, it's still a harsh uh, research area. Although I also want to, to look into that. But thank you. I'm sorry, I know you have lots of questions, but we have one more question left uh, in this uh, project. Uh, thank you, Jules. Uh, uh, I'm not a forester, I'm a marine biologist, so uh, my question would be on, uh, maybe on the, on the aquatic side of uh, the area. So uh, you mentioned that the, the pygmy forest portion is uh, a, a bit uh, with water. Even from the tall poles, right? And, and yes. even on the tall poles. So I, I'm just wondering if, uh, you mentioned also that rainfall is the major source of uh, water. Yes. So uh, how long would this uh, pit uh, forest uh, have a uh, water? And what's the water there? Okay. Sir, as, as far as I have been reading the, the, the previous studies about Kaimpugan peatland, Actually, Kaimpugan Pitan is situated in a type of climate which has uniform rainfalls throughout the year. So actually, according to the local people, only the months April and May is the driest. And the rest is really wet. But when I went there, it's still wet. And uh, I, I do not know the, the level of water table, for example. But we have, uh, I have uh, observed that the water table is encountered almost near the surface of the pit. What, what I mean is, uh, uh, is there uh, something like an above ground uh, water that, uh, or a flooding? Uh, along the, the fringes of the peatland, there is a stream. Is it on the, on the yellow portion of the, the, the map? or it's the, the yellow portions are open areas. Open areas. Uh, there are two major rivers, Agusan River and Gibong. Uh -huh. but quite far from the from the periphery of the peatland. There is a small stream at the periphery itself, but the color of the water is already black. The same, the same with the water observed in the pygmy forest, which according to Indonesian literatures, they are called um, black water peat, uh, black water in peat, in peats. Okay, uh, what, what I'm leading to is uh, on two points. One is on the ecosystem services that uh, the lady was uh, asking earlier. And the second one is uh, uh, on, on the uh, carbon uh, uh, something like, uh, storage. Uh, what would be perhaps the function of the water in the area? Because you're looking at uh, on the forest only. But uh, uh, is, is, uh, it might not be part of your study, but uh, the question is, what is the function of that water portion? wherein there might be some algae or uh, some uh, s uh, some other uh, invertebrates that may, might be contributing to the total carbon that you have uh, or, uh, that you have uh, measured in the uh, in the soil because they, they decompose as well anyway in, in the, so uh, that's that's what that's one point that I'm uh, I'm putting in uh, it might be high in the in, in that area but there might be contribution of the, the aquatic habitat, not only mainly on the forest. So that's that's one. Uh, secondly, on the it, that the reason why I'm asking if uh, there's an above ground uh, flooding, because if you have for perhaps uh, something like a prolonged uh, uh, something like a availability of water, then the other service for that area, which you could perhaps uh, uh, introduce to the people, would be to culture fish. Because uh, I believe that even if you will uh, give them something like a all protection without a livelihood, then uh, I think uh, you will not uh, you will not be able to uh, limit that protection. So you need to give them uh, give them an alternative. So that's that's uh, that's the the two points that I uh, I think.
thank you, Lillian, please. Thank you, sir. Um, yes, uh, I, I did not examine the, the water component, the, the black water pools. There are deep pools, as deep as here, sir. And uh, according to literatures in Indonesia, there are black water fishes. And according to my forest guide, because we ate bagoong, and we, we threw the bagoong, um, this is the root system, we threw, and this is a thick forest litter. So we threw the bagoong, and then we heard the fish. And uh, the forest guides even said that they catch some hito there, even if they just create a square hole and then they have fish. So that's a very interesting aspect also, sir. Thank you. I, I will pass it on to people more, more knowledgeable with that. And also with the second, about the livelihood and the culture of fish. Yes, sir, thank you so much for that input. But uh, since I am more into soils, soils person, um, instead of, there should be development actually in the periphery, we can no longer convert it back to peatland. So what should be done there, especially with the farming communities, is the right choice of crop that is suitable for acidic soils, such as tubers and taro and all uh, these things. Thank you, sir. Uh, just a moment, may I help you answer the questions by the two gentlemen? The wildlife in the Philippine forests, particularly in Agusan Sur, in Agusan Norte, uh, is complete. We have monkeys and birds about. Uh, when the monkeys and the birds uh, eat, eat the fruits uh, of the trees and the, what do you call this? The dick and the small trees. And the chicken, the pigs, and the deer eat them below. So, there is now the need for protecting the forest, whether the forest is uh, composed of mostly of big trees or intermediate trees or small trees, does not matter. Just because usually there are very few big trees where the small trees are, and the birds and the monkeys uh, uh, what do you call this, uh, uh, have their, shelter, their uh, shelter in these big trees, and when they eat, they drop the seeds. And then this year now is where the chicken, the deer, and the wild pigs have their picnics. So one one problem, uh, I want one suggestion is that, uh, like we did in Nasib Plumber and Gwenyo Industrial, in Nagusan Norte, Nagusan Sur, we planted fruit trees, like lansones, uh, and then also bananas, because uh, the, the bananas, are the, well, it's the favorite of the wild pigs and the fruits are the, are, uh, are the, the protorates of the monkeys, the birds, and the animals below. Now, with regards to the water, uh, water uh, aspect, uh, we have the, the bana. It's like, uh, it's like uh, bangus, except it is more delicious. And, uh, instead of being long, it is, uh, what do you call this, almost circular in shape. And what we did before is, we use the dynamite. There is no, <laughs> there is no regulation in dynamite fishing in the rivers. There is in the, in the ocean, in the sea, but not in the river. So, according to the Philippine constabulary, well, you don't, but just so, you give the force to us. <laughs> and so, uh, also, in the lower portions of the creeks, the rivers, we have these different kinds of uh, aquatic uh, uh, lives like what? We have the, uh, you say the, the dalap, the dito, uh, the crabs, the shrimps, and uh, almost every aquatic life is there. So here now is uh, a need to preserve uh, these uh, this creeks and rivers by planting uh, according to the LDA, planting uh, what do you call this? Uh, bamboos along, along this so that uh, the, the creeks will be preserved. And then my suggestion is again when you go back to Usanso, <laughs> suggest that uh, please inform them that above the bamboos you should plant bananas and avocado. Because this will provide the fiber, the fruits, and then 
the waste the waste later on will be used for uh, producing mushroom and after the mushroom this can now be composted uh, and with the use of the uh, African night crawler you can have, you can now produce the best organic fertilizer ever. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, there are wild boars and wild monkeys also in Kainbugan Pitland. However, we cannot plant bananas there for sure they won't survive due to the conditions. Thank you for all your questions and your suggestions.